and I think it's time to get started. So we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar series dedicated to the research and academic communities. Uh, the seminar takes plus place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this Kiskit YouTube channel. I'm delighted to see so many of you tuned in. I am your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the distinct pleasure and privilege of uh, inviting Dr. Serge Rosenblum uh, from the Weizmann Institute. And uh, hello, Serge. Uh, how are you today? Hi, Zlatko. Uh, thank you for the two kind uh, introduction. I'm doing great. Thanks. And where are you tuning in from today, Serge? You know, it's my favorite question to ask. Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, I'm in uh, Rehovot, which is a small city in uh, the middle of Israel, where the Weizmann Institute is located. And as you can see, for us, uh, it's just uh, sunset. So the Sabbath has just entered. So, All right. Uh, yep. Uh, that, 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 that's quite lovely. I'm in New York myself, just in the middle of the day. And before we pull up your slides, Serge, let me give a quick background. Uh, Dr. Rosenblum uh, did his PhD at the Weizmann Institute, uh, following which he took a postdoctoral offer at Yale University with Dr. Rob Kukov, which is where I had the pleasure of meeting Serge. And um, that's where I learned that beyond being a great physicist, there's lots of great things that Serge is uh, able to do and capable. I'll leave those for the question and answer period after this. Uh, in 2019, Serge went back to the Weizmann Institute to start his uh, group there. Um, and uh, today, I think we'll hear more about that. And the reversal uh, and reversing the effect of errors during quantum operations. So uh, Serge, uh, you know the format is interactive. People can ask questions during the talk. And it is my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thanks, let's go, and I'd be, I'd be very happy to answer anyone's questions, so please interrupt me. Uh, so as you said, I'm a, a new faculty at the Weizmann Institute, uh, but today I will be uh, presenting work from my previous research uh, at Yale University in the lab of um, Robert Sholkoff. So today uh, we'll be discussing the, object, the subject of uh, error correction, and this uh, subject is often looked at as a, um, a feature that you can implement once you have very large circuits. Um, and this is for sure an important aspect, but in this talk, I hope to convince you that we can already start incorporating ideas from error correction and fault tolerance at the few qubit scale. So that we can then scale up in a more robust way. And today's story is about how we can identify errors that happen when we manipulate quantum information. And we'll see how to reverse their effects all without disturbing the encoded information. So, before I get started, uh, I just want to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues and collaborators from the groups of uh, Liang Zhang, Michel Debray, and Mazar Mirahimi. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, Phil Reinhold, who's now at HRL, for doing uh, most of the work in this uh, presentation, and also Wenlong Ma, who uh, developed the theoretical framework. So if you'd like to read more about uh, this research, I encourage you to look up uh, the two articles that um, you can see here at the bottom uh, that were just published about this work. All right, so uh, in the spirit of the times, I'd like to start with a wonderful Zoom lecture by Steve Gervin uh, that he gave um, for the Yale Quantum Institute summer lecture series. So Steve was talking about um, Alice, who is, um, works in air traffic control and Alice wants to send a message to Bob, who's a pilot. So uh, she wants to urgently tell him that he has to hold short of taxiway TDB. Um, but the problem is he might not understand the message because noise might blur the distinction between these three letters, T, D, and B. They're very close to one another. So Steve proceeds uh, by explaining that if instead Alice says, United 517, hold short of taxiway Tango Delta Bravo, well, then it's uh, much clearer. So as a non-native speaker of English, I always like to put on subtitles. And even though Steve speaks very slowly and clearly, the auto transcript gives some very troubling results. So it appears as though, as though Steve was saying that Allah says 9 and 597, hold short of taxiway Tango Delta Bravo. So unknowingly, Steve himself gave a very nice uh, demonstration of quantum error correction. And as you can see, many words were completely distorted, but Tango, Delta, and Bravo came through just fine. And that's no coincidence, 
These words were designed to be far apart in acoustic space from other words so that they can remain clearly distinguishable even in the presence of noise. So that's the key behind both classical and quantum error correction. So that's to encode your uh, symbol redundantly in a larger register. So you can then, under certain assumptions, be confident that your information will be robust to errors. For example, if you assume uh, noise is unlikely to affect more than one letter at a time, then it's clear that by encoding, say, L as Lima, you'll do a good job of securing the message. For example, if the M switches to an N in your message, the simple error correction algorithm can identify that Lina is actually a distorted version of Lima. So uh, besides just uh, transmitting and uh, storing data, we also want to uh, process our data. Um, but of course, it would be unwise to decode your uh, information, then apply a certain operation, and then encode it again later. And that's because, of course, you become sensitive to errors during the operation. Instead, what we need to do is to apply encoded gates, which, which apply the desired operation uh, in the encoded space. So we are never, never allowed to uh, leave this uh, safe space of uh, quantum error correction. So the question is, um, what do these encoded gates look like? So turning from classical letters to uh, actual quantum information, which is what we're here for today, let's assume we have a bunch of physical qubits that uh, together encodes one logical protected qubit. And now we wish to apply some operation to that logical qubit. So what does the gate, uh, what could a gate look like? For example, the operation could look like uh, some interaction, some uh, C not gate in this case between qubit one and qubit three. This is just a schematic to uh, bring up across a point. But this operation is very problematic because an error on qubit one will propagate and cause an error also on qubit number three. So if our original assumption was that only a single qubit error can be corrected, then now we have introduced an uncorrectable error. So our encoded gate should be fault tolerant, meaning that it's not allowed to turn correctable errors into uncorrectable ones. So what tricks can we apply to make our encoded gates fault tolerant? Well, one very popular solution is to use transversal gates. And this means that the gates are not allowed to couple uh, physical qubits within the same logical qubit. So by definition, transversal gates are guaranteed to be fault tolerant since uh, errors cannot spread uh, between uh, qubits within a single block. Unfortunately for us, let me, oh, yeah, here you can see that the single error just does not propagate. And unfortunately, Easton and Knill proved that under some very general assumptions, it's just impossible to create all the gates you would like to create in such a transversal way. So in other words, uh, transversal gates are not universal. And that's really unfortunate because it would make the construction of a quantum computer much, much easier if that were not the case. Probably IBM would, be, would have been done by now. Okay. <laughs> um, so instead, we need to find other ways of making fault tolerant gates. So one very popular solution to get around this is to use to invoke ancilla qubits. And ancilla qubits are uh, kind of helper qubits that help us achieve certain tasks, such as applying gates or doing error correction, but they don't themselves carry logical information. So uh, we can initialize, initialize them in a fixed state, and then at the end of the task, measure them or discard them altogether. Now, it turns out that by using these extra qubits, we can actually achieve universal quantum computation. But once again, we run into the same problem. So errors from the ancilla can propagate uh, to the logical qubits. And this can be fixed if we apply the same trick again, if we introduce even more ancilla qubits and do this interaction with the logical block, also in a transversal way, et cetera. So the point that I want to get across is that there is a trade-off. And the trade-off is that we have to pay a huge price in hardware and complexity of our quantum computer 
in order to make our operations fault tolerant. So it's clear that we would gain a lot if we had some way to stop errors from propagating using much fewer parts. And this is what um, I'm going to show you in this talk. All right, so uh, let's have a let's use a different kind of depiction of what I was talking about. So consider this picture where we have a single logical qubit in blue and an ancilla qubit in red, which interact with one another. Now, in general, there, there will be errors in the logical system and in the ancilla, but we already know how to deal with logical errors with the help of quantum error correction. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be focusing on ancilla errors only. So I want you to consider the following scenario. Suppose we want to apply a certain gate U1 to the logical qubit. Now, thanks to this interaction that we have, we can achieve this by starting with the ancilla in some state psi A, and then carrying the ancilla along a certain trajectory to some other state psi B. But now suppose the ancilla suffers an error during that um, operation. And this can cause the ancilla to follow a different path towards its final state. So in general, this would result in a different gate being applied to the logical qubit. And of course, this is in general an uncorrectable error. So in other words, the coherence in the ancilla has propagated to the logical qubit. And this way of looking at it should look vaguely familiar. So it reminds us of something we learned a long time ago. So uh, let's uh, use this uh, nice example here. Of, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Zlatko, I just had to do that. So suppose Zlatko is doing some uh, his daily morning routine and he's running from point A to B. But unfortunately, Zlatko was thinking about quantum computation instead of focusing on the trail. And now he has no idea how many calories he's burned during his run. So that, of course, makes him very sad. This is too realistic. <laughs> it is, it is, yes. This is uh, a real story. So um, fortunately for us, Zlatko has um, a pair of fl frictionless shoes. And he knows that gravity is a conservative force with zero curl. And so from classical physics, he can tell that the number of calories he burned is just the line integral of the force along his trajectory. And that's independent of the path he's taken. So the energy he has burned, the calories he has burned, are um, entirely fixed by the starting point and the end point. So we will use a related concept for achieving fault tolerant control called a path independent gates. And you can read more about this uh, in uh, Wenlong's paper uh, that was just pub published in PRL. Hmm. So we want to devise a gate in which the applied unitary... I, I will just echo here the feedback of the audience since you can't see them directly, but you're getting a lot of LOLs and ha-has. <laughs> so uh, thank sure, you for bringing in this, uh, this nice analogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> when I invite you, you can do the same. So. Uh, <laughs> We want to devise a gate in which the applied unitary on the logical qubit is independent of the ancilla trajectory. So formally, we can write it in this way here. Um, so for all propagators G with fewer than n errors, the unitary should not depend on the number of errors or the time of their occurrences. So you can see here, I, I don't have a pointer, but uh, you can see that this operation to the left gives rise to a fixed unitary uh, on the logical qubit. So this condition is, of course. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you explain it more, but maybe you can help us understand a little bit better. So there's, um, you know, nth order, you know, nth order in what I guess you mean in, in number of error operations applied. And then, uh, so I guess this is all with respect to a certain set of errors you've identified as the native errors. Yeah, so that's a good question. Of course, I will go more deeply into this. But what I'm referring to is, suppose you have some set of errors that you would want to be protected against. Then we say that we are uh, path independent up to nth order to some error. If we can, if, if there are fewer than n errors, the unitary does not change. Mm -hmm. okay? so we can tolerate up to n errors. Uh, and we will see examples of that later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, if we have more than n errors, the unitary could change, and then we we do have an error. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so and and I guess here you're not measuring the errors, right? This is still time continuous. So in a sense, you know, usually we make this uh, model that the errors are you know x, y, or z gates, for instance, on a qubit. But of course, they're usually time continuous, right? There. But when you measure them, you project them into x, y, or z. You project into an error, but here you have a continuous error, right? So um, I guess this, this sort of this is kind of the the model base of, uh, and and it, there'll be some maybe fine detail, but we can ignore the time continuity to a degree. You could think of of the errors as discrete events that happen along the way. Okay, and there will be a measurement at the end, but I'll, I'll get to that. So maybe I'll I'll uh, finish the slides and then I will be happy to maybe clarify further. Yeah. So, uh, so what uh, Wen Lung from the Jiang Group uh, from Yale and now Chicago showed is um, that you can show that path independence is a so sorry the, the path independence can be achieved if with every transition between two and Scylla states you can identify that transition with a certain unitary on the logical qubit and that the chaining of consecutive and Scylla transitions corresponds to um, the unitary between the first and last in Scylla states. That's a path independence condition. Okay, so in other words, if the Scylla goes from A to K and from K to some other states, et cetera, et cetera, and in the end, the Scylla ends up in B, then the, the multiplication of all those unitaries have to give rise to uh, the unitary that would correspond to a straight transition from A to B. So this is exactly what we saw uh, earlier in your example um, with the running, right? So the uh, integral, well, the, the integral over the force along the entire trajectory should correspond to just the energy at the end minus the energy at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we do the dependence on whatever happened in the middle. So this is uh, the path independence condition, okay? And uh, to give you just a brief taste uh, of how this condition works in practice, and we'll get to the examples later on. So we can first consider Ancilla dephasing errors. So for example, dephasing errors happen when the environment measures your Ancilla, okay? So uh, in, in effect, the Ancilla is projected onto one of its uh, eigenstates. So you can see here in this expression that instead of going straight from A to B like you wanted, the Ancilla now goes from A to E where it's projected by uh, the environment, and then goes from E to B. But you can see that if the path condition, the path independence condition is satisfied, then your uh, total unitary has not changed. Okay? And in fact, you can convince yourself that you can throw in as many projection operators as you want. It will not change the total unitary that you have applied. So this shows that if your path independence condition is satisfied, you can tolerate an infinite number of the phasing errors on your ancilla. And I hope I, this will become clear uh, soon. Okay. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and a similar argument holds for relaxation errors. So in, with a relaxation error, your ancilla uh, states relaxes or jumps from one state to another. But there too, if you can associate um, a certain uh, unitary with that jump, then if the path independence condition is met, once again, your total unitary was not affected by this uh, relaxation, okay? Let me just uh, drop in one more slide and then I will uh, be happy to answer the questions. So of course, uh, you can say that there is no particular reason that um, <laughs> in, when you're running that you should reach the correct final location, okay? You could just end entirely in the wrong uh, endpoint, but in quantum physics, we know that that doesn't matter. So um, as long as we know where we are, okay, we have applied a deterministic operation. In your case, you know exactly how many calories you've burned, even if it's not the number you uh, you were hoping for. Okay, so the same is true in our case. Since the ancilla does not carry logical operation, we're going to measure it at the end of the gate. And this measurement will tell us unequivocally which unitary was applied. Okay, so just to summarize this, the protocol is going to be that we're going to initialize the ancilla. We're going to 
carry the ancilla along a desired path to implement our gates on the logical qubits. And then at the end, we measure our ancilla. If the ancilla is in the desired final state, we are guaranteed by path independence that the correct operation was applied, even if there were uh, errors in between. If the ancilla was in the wrong state, we know exactly what operation was applied to the logical qubits, and we can correct that error. And then if you want, you, we can repeat the gate. So of course, the, the entire uh, difficulty will be to engineer a type of interaction for which this path independence condition holds. So maybe that, this is a good time to stop and answer some, some questions. Yeah, thank you. This is a really beautiful kind of introduction to at, at, a, at a high level to this. Uh, there are a few questions from the audience and there's a bit of a discussion. I, I'll mention, since you can't see the chat directly, uh, Phil, Phil is also here. So hello, Phil Reinhold. Uh, and Phil has been chiming in and helping answer some questions. So thank you, Phil. Uh, there was a question about the uh, the path, the, the qubit accumulating phase along the path. Uh, path. And uh, I think that that was maybe already answered in the chat. but. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Phil, for doing my job. <laughs> um, yeah, so as long as this phase is deterministic, then first of all, then certainly we don't have to worry. Yes. And right. so mm -hmm. maybe is there another question that was not answered? Uh, yeah, this one is. Uh, as I give examples, this will become a lot clearer. Let's just please go ahead, Slatko. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I think I started putting the example in my head of, of your recent paper and that helped clarify, but you'll get to that. So um, from Bryant, um, can this kind of idea or methodology also be used in order to predict uh, what happens? And I think maybe you've clarified this question a little bit. What happens when you have uh, maybe some of these factors and variables, but aren't necessarily certain of the relationship or degree of the dependency. I think the question is along the lines of, well, what if you don't necessarily know, uh, you know, all these processes ahead of time, right? You don't have a great model, uh, you know, to, but maybe, you know, how much knowledge of the system do you need to actually uh, take advantage of this? Or is there some, in some case where you can just throw your hands up and say, well, I know that it works, uh, but I don't know individually what the processes are. Uh, maybe that's a little vague. But... Yeah, so uh, just like any kind of quantum error correction protocol, it's designed, the protocol is designed to uh, fix a certain type of errors. And usually it's a dominant errors that you want to tackle. So, um, so you have to identify a certain set of errors and then those errors can be tolerated, at least to the order uh, that you protected. But uh, a general error that is not, um, that breaks your path independence condition, if you like, would not be protected in our case. But this is a general feature in every type of quantum error correction. So you always have to build layer upon layer in any case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is really cool. It's a great idea. And there's a lot of excitement in the chat about it. And um, it, you, in the model here that you gave for the dephasing, for instance, right, you, you, you assume that the environment in the simple model, maybe, you know, that the environment essentially projects you onto a particular state. Um, mm -hmm. What if, uh, you know, does all the argument hold the same if the environment uh, applies a particular gate instead of projecting you onto a specific state? I guess that's maybe just a different unraveling of the trajectory, so to yeah. speak, is it equivalent. So another way to look at um, the phasing. Uh, as you, so you can look at it, uh, you can look at it as a projection, but you can also look at it as a random Z gate applied to the ancilla, a random phase gate. This, this is why it's called the phasing. So in that case, we would be fine. Um, and relaxation, you could think of it as an, an X gate in some sense. Uh, but certainly there are, uh, as as I said before, there are operations on the ancilla that if the uh, environment were to apply those randomly, we would not be protected. Uh, to take this to the extreme, if you hit the fridge with a hammer, this is also an operation and path independence certainly does not solve that. Yes, excellent, uh, that's a good one. Or so ionizing radiation. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so I, I hope that with uh, some real life uh, examples, this, this may become clear. So uh, what we're going to do is to implement this uh, error-corrected uh, gate 
using path independence in an experiment. Now, the traditional approach that most of us know is to do error correction by uh, encoding a single logical qubit in many physical qubits that are laid out in this um, uh, surface array, like this uh, very outdated picture of, uh, that I uh, took from the internet of IBM. Um, and this encoding in many physical qubits provides necessary redundancy. But the approach we um, like to take at Yale uses instead a single element to the right, which is a superconducting cavity. And that's essentially just a box made of a superconductor that supports microwave uh, resonance modes. And you can see a representation of this mode uh, in this red shaded volume. And one of the reasons that we like to use cavities is uh, that they have really good coherence times of about one millisecond. So that's because most of the energy is stored in vacuum as opposed to uh, in the chip. Um, and that's about an order of magnitude more than conventional uh, Josephson junction qubits. Uh, but more importantly, a single cavity mode has a built-in redundancy. So rather than being a two-level system, our microwave mode has many photon number states that we can use to our benefit. Um, so this is going to be our redundancy, the many photon number states of our microwave mode. And um, finally, the noise structure is extremely simple. So to a pretty good approximation, all that happens in our cavity is that photons um, are lost. And this is much simpler than the many different kinds of errors you can have when you use many physical qubits. So um, as we will see, this large number of states and the simple noise structure will help us achieve a hardware efficient way of doing quantum error correction. And these are called um, bosonic codes. So we will use the cavity to encode our logical qubits. Um, but as we know from uh, my introduction, we will not be able to generate the full amount of gates that we would like with just the cavity. Uh, instead, we need to add an ancilla qubit, which could be, for example, the traditional transmon, which is also used by IBM. Um, and this ancilla will help us to achieve the gates that we want to uh, apply. And it's relatively unfortunate that we have to do that because we have to now ruin this pristine and high quality cavity with this noisy and select qubits. Okay, so it becomes really important in this case to prevent the propagation of errors from the antilla to the logical qubits. So let's worry about this a bit later. First, I just want to tell you about how we uh, describe states in our cavity, and I apologize to the experts who well, I'm sure know this. So one way to do that is to write down the photon number occupations or amplitudes, as I've done here, um, on the bottom right. But another way to describe state is to think of our cavity as a harmonic oscillator of the electromagnetic field. And we can just think of our mode as a pendulum uh, living in a continuous position momentum phase space. And we can use the Wigner function to describe the distribution of our state in position and momentum space, so X and P. So for example, a semi-classical coherent state is just a blob that is displaced from the vacuum. Um, and with time, it uh, it's, uh, makes circles around the origin. So uh, unlike a classical pendulum, a quantum pendulum can be in a superposition of coherent states with opposite phases. And these states are called cat states, okay, because they're uh, ideally a superposition of a macroscopic uh, wave function. Um, here you can see the Wigner function for a very small cat that only has a few photons. So um, aptly, we call it a kitten state. Uh, but instead of having just two blobs, as we'd expect, the Wigner function now has these weird fringes at the origin. Um, and the value of those fringes can even become negative. And one way to think of these fringes is as the interference pattern that emerges when these two blobs of the quantum pendulum meet at the origin, right? So the, the fringes are, in fact, an indication of the coherence of our superposition. Okay, so now that we um, know this, we can uh, start discussing of how we encode uh, a qubit inside the cavity. 
in a way that's protected against errors. So we will pick two states of our um, microwave mode as our logical zero and our logical one. So in our experiment, we'll be using the so-called kitten codes. And in the kitten code, the logical zero is a superposition of zero and four. And the logical one is just the two photon clock state. And the reason that this is called the kitten code is uh, because as, as you can see to the left here, uh, the, the positive and negative superposition of zero and one are in fact the kitten states we just saw. So why do we bother using the kitten code? Well, you can see um, from this uh, block sphere picture that all the states in our encoding have an even number of photons. So this, uh, even, uh, this even parity is in fact a redundant bit of information. We can use that to correct errors. So you'll remember that the dominant error in our cavity is in fact photon loss. So when a photon is lost, we jump from, from this even code space to an odd error space, right? If you have an even number of photons, you lose one. Now you have an odd number of photons. So if we can track using our ancilla, the number, the photon number parity of our cavity, then we can detect that the photon loss happened. But actually we can do more than just detect the error because all of the states in this encoding have the, the same average number of photons the outgoing photon doesn't know where, which state it came from, and so it doesn't steal the information with it. So we can actually detect and also recover the original qubit. So this is how the kitten code works. Uh, and in fact, uh, similar codes were used both at Yale and at Tsinghua um, to reach what's called the break-even point of quantum error correction, um, which is the first demonstration of error correction that actually helps make a qubit better. So this is nice. We know about our logical kitten qubits. Uh, but now we have to talk about the ancilla and how it, the ancilla interacts with our logical qubits uh, in order to apply all the operations we want to apply. So we use the ancilla to encode and decode our kittens. We use it to do error correction and to measure the parity of the cavity. But for the purposes of this talk, what's important is that we will use it to apply logical gates to our cavity mode. So let's discuss what type of interaction there is between the ancilla and the cavity. Well, it turns out that if they have very different resonance frequencies, we get a so-called dispersive coupling between the two. And what that means is that the cavity photons change the resonance frequency of the ancilla. So indeed, uh, on this graph on the bottom, you can see that when we measure the transition frequency of the ancilla from the ground state G to the excited state E, we see that it is shifted. So we see these shifted Lorentzians depending on the number of photons in the cavity. And this, um, this constant frequency by which, it, by which it, is, it is shifted is called chi. This is the dispersive interaction rate. OK? So you can see that the, uh, and that the ancilla uh, transition has a spectral separation. It can, it can separate between photon number occupations using this dispersive interaction. And this is what we're going to use to apply our gate. So if we apply, yeah. And I question? guess just to point yes. out that that uh, the dots here are the data, right? Oh yes, I should. Yes, that's a very good point. Just uh, so, because they look so amazingly. <laughs> yeah. You can tell that it's data because it does not reach one entirely. Uh, there is some uh, decay of our um, measurements of our qubit when we read it out. Uh, but yes, we are in fact reading this out experimentally. And so the, the purple uh, Lorentzian on the right is really a measurement of a four photon clock state. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, a yeah, really beautiful data again. Right. So, um, so as I said, we will use this spectral separation to address the ancilla for each one of those clock states separately. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply a slow selective pulse to the ancilla that will bring the ancilla from G to E, but with a different phase for each photon number. Okay, so if we uh, send a sine wave at the frequency that corresponds to uh, N equals zero, zero photons in the cavity, we could send a cosine wave to the N equals one components. Okay, so we can, re we can really uh, control the phase that we apply to each 
total number. Okay, and this way we impart an arbitrary phase to each clock state component in our state. And search. So um, another way to see. This Maybe you can um, help remind us a little bit too. So the way you apply this is by having a different, if you want, pulse applied to each one. I mean, uh, concurrently to each peak concurrently, um, right? Yeah, that's and then, a very good question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe you elaborate. But basically, you know, there's, there's. Well, actually, yeah, maybe you don't need to worry about. So do you have to worry about the uh, spectral leakage of each one, or can you just design your Pulse shape in the right way all, all together, and how do you do that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, of course, you could apply first a pulse to uh, the n equals zero transition, and then do it for the n equals one transition. Um, so you would apply different frequencies at different times, but that's of course very inefficient. So what we do is we actually apply all those different frequencies uh, simultaneously. Okay, and I, I think I have a slide about that later. Um, and as you said, that go. So um, ideally, you would like a delta uh, in frequency. We only want to apply um, the gate, the, the pulses at the desired frequencies. But in practice, we only have a finite amount of time for our gate. So the shorter we make our gate, the broader our pulses become in frequency, and the less selective they become. That's not good. But if we make our pulse too long then we accumulate too many errors on the ancilla. So the trick is to find some compromise between uh, spectral uh, addressability and ancilla decoherence. Okay, so in our case, the, the pulse that we sent is um, about one and, one and a half to two microseconds long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I see, yeah, so that, that's sufficient to resolve. Well, um, but is the way you construct the pulse simply the sum of the control pulses on each of the peaks individually, or is it constructed by a different technique? Yeah, it's just a sum. Um, and you can do some pulse shaping to minimize the spectral overlap with the different peaks if you like. Yes, but ultimately you will always be limited by this time energy uncertainty relation. There's nothing you can fundamentally do about that. Right. And uh, how fancy do you have to get in the pulse shaping? Like what? what... Yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, we maybe we're definitely... it's really I don't know. I, I don't want to break your flow too much. <laughs> no, it's a good question. And to be entirely honest, we've definitely tried that. Um, I, I don't think it mattered too much. If it did, I would have remembered that I don't. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think we do not do any uh, special pulse shaping. Right, yeah, because you could you could try to shape, I guess, each one to have a minimum of the you know leakage on at the next order of the of the peak. But uh, I guess your pulse is quite long, so maybe you you just don't have that much bleeding through of, uh, into the other. Yeah. yeah, we do not. We do not have a lot of bleeding, and uh, we we will be limited by other things, as you will see. Um, yeah, those are those are very good points. Thank you. Uh, and, and then each peak is calibrated individually yes. in terms of the amplitude of the pulse that you send. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So uh, for our gate to be path independent, as you will see, we need the ancilla to go up from G to E simultaneously for all states in our logical system. So, uh, so our ancilla should not know whether there are zero photons or two photons or four photons in the cavity. So the only way to do that is by having the rates be exactly the same for all uh, photon states. And we do calibrate those independently. And I guess for the audience member who's coming from not cavity world, but uh, always qubit world, uh, this is, this is a, a, by the way, heated discussion we had in, in the summer school lectures. I recently uh, <laughs> talked to the connected qubits. You know, we were talking about, are there only qubit people and oscillator people? I think I know which type of person you are. Uh, but, for, <laughs> but for the qubit people in the audience, uh, I guess we could equally well say perhaps here that, um, well, actually, maybe it's a little more so. But uh, in, in a sense, it's almost like you have you know uh, five ancillas in one uh, main logical state here, right? Uh, logical system, if you want. Uh, so each pair of the, or each FOC level here, tensor qubit is uh, almost, um, well, maybe maybe that's, that's not, 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 part of our encoding. Yeah. Uh, 
so I, I wouldn't really say that. And just uh, to, to settle the debate, uh, we have both uh, a spin and an oscillator, and I love them both equally. So, um, He's coming, right. sir. <laughs> I have to be politically correct here. So, um, yeah, just to finish this train of thought. So once again, we will drive the ancilla from G to E, and uh, we will do so with different phases. And uh, this way, we can apply, apply a phase gate. So we can apply arbitrary phases to each box state component. And another way to think about that is shown on the box here is at the bottom. You can see that there is a different geometric phase associated uh, with each photon box state. So this is a very powerful uh, cavity operation or a family of gates that we call the snap gates which stands for a selective number dependent arbitrary phase gate. And we can use this operation to perform logical gates on our encoded kitten qubit. So if you'll remember, our logical one is just the two photon Fox state, and the logical zero is zero plus four photons. So if we want to apply a phase gate on this encoded space, then we have to apply a certain, a certain phase to the one to the logical one and another phase to the logical zero. So what we'll do is we'll apply zero phase to zero and four, and we'll apply an arbitrary phase theta to the two photon Fox state. And this will perform a rotation around the z-axis of our logical box here with any arbitrary angle theta. So to show you this in an experiment, and this is also data. So in this experiment, we vary the phase that we apply to the two photon box state, and then we measure the Wigner function of the cavity. So we start with this kitten state, and as we vary the phase in our snap gate, you can see that we rotate our qubit around the equator of our block sphere. Okay, so this uh, phase gate does work in practice. Um, and we can choose any angle we want, but for simplicity, we'll focus for the rest of the talk on a very specific pi over two rotation for the rest uh, yeah, for the rest of this discussion. So all you have to remember is that this gate is supposed to take uh, this kitten state to this clown-shaped uh, state on the top. So if we get this clown face, we know that the gate succeeded. So uh, now during the snap gates, of course, as we said before, the logical qubit and the ancilla become entangled. And because our ancilla qubit is very noisy, it's a regular transmon, um, then if there is an error in our ancilla qubit, it will propagate and become a logical error. So the main question that we ask ourselves is, how do we protect the logical qubits against ancilla errors during the gate? So our first task is to distinguish between three possible outcomes. Okay, and these are the three dominant occurrences. Um, well, three dominant things that can happen to our transmon. Either there is no error, or the ancilla has a relaxation event, so an energy decay event, or there is an ancilla dephasing event. So if you want to identify which one happens, it makes sense to not use only two levels in our ancilla, but three. Okay, so we use we use both all three G, E, and F, which is the which is the third state. <clears throat> and instead of applying our snap drive between G and E, we will apply the drive between G and F without ever populating E, okay? So after this GF snap gate, we measure the ancilla, and this ancilla measurement will tell us what happens during the gate. So if there was no error at all, we will end up in F, and the logical gate is successful. We have a happy cloud phase here. But if we measure that the ancilla is in E, well, that means that there was a relaxation event uh, and the ancilla jumped from F to E. Now, surprisingly, you see that there is still a cloud phase, so the gate still worked. And that's because a relaxation event means that the, Q, the ancilla had to pass through F, okay? So in fact, what happened is you completed this geometric phase, you completed your trajectory, and then you drop down to E, okay? And finally, if we measure G, 
Well, it turns out that that means that we had a dephasing error. Okay, the, the environment projected us to G. Sometimes we're projected to F, but that, that's trivial, that's no problem. So when we're projected to G, our snap gate has failed and we remain in our original kitten state. Um, but that's not a big deal because at least we have a deterministic uh, operation, well, which is the identity, and we can just reapply the gates. Okay, so no matter what we measure, uh, what the outcome is of our Antilla measurement, we have a fixed uh, operation that was applied to our logical qubits. So this should ring a bell. And indeed, this gate was designed to meet the path independence requirements that I discussed in the beginning. Okay, so maybe after this slide, I, I will uh, stop for answering questions, but this kind of uh, closes the, the story. Um, so let's look at this graph. We can see here uh, that there are multiple Ancilla transitions. So we have G at the bottom, E in the middle, and F at the top. So the snap operation is represented by green arrows. So as we know, the, uh, Ancilla, if the Ancilla goes from G to F, then we have applied our snap gates S theta. And it turns out that this same operation, when the Ancilla is in F, and uh, well, the, when, sorry, when the snap gate brings F to G, the opposite phase is applied. And that's because the geometric phase uh, uh, switches sign when you rotate in the other direction. Okay? So instead of S theta, you have S minus theta. So what that means is that if you go from G to F and back to G, you have the identity operation. And this is um, necessary for us to meet our path independence requirements. Right? Just like when you have a force, and you integrate the force along a closed loop, well, then you have uh, spent no energy, zero energy, right? So here too, a closed loop should result in an identity operation. So if we now have dephasing, so dephasing can be seen as a uh, projection, so a transition from a state to itself, this is associated with an identity operation on the cavity. And so it doesn't change uh, the, the fact that uh, if you uh, have a, a closed uh, cycle, you get still the identity. Okay, so any way, any path you draw that begins in G and ends up in G, for example, will be the identity. And any path that you want to draw between G and F will have the, the S theta applied to it. So this, is, this way we can see that our gate is uh, path independent to infinite order for the phasing errors. Now, if we had a relaxation from F to G, this would break this path independence, okay? Because now you would have a, a different unitary uh, associated with staying in G, and that's not allowed. But that doesn't happen. So, and still our relaxation is from F to E, and that's an, all, an entirely different transition to begin with, okay? So this is why when we measure E, there is no confusion here. The operation that was applied was S theta times the identity. So we're good. So the only way path independence is broken in our story here is when you have two relaxation errors. Okay, so when you have two relaxation errors, you start from G, you go to F, so that's S theta, and then you relax twice, uh, which gives you twice identity. And that means that you have applied S theta uh, while you started in G and you ended up in G. So this breaks path independence. So what that means is that we're path independence only to first order uh, for relaxation errors. All right, so this might have been a bit confusing. So maybe I will answer some questions right now before I move on to the experimental data. I don't have that much time. It's... Yes, thank you, Serge. This is really great. There is a question here from uh, Krishnan. If you perform a measurement on the ancilla once it's entangled with the logical qubit, does that not collapse the logical qubit state also? Or what is the, um, you know, are there any other negative effects to worry about in doing that operation? That's an excellent question. So um, you remember that we said that uh, we have to drive all the states, all the proton states simultaneously. Uh, otherwise, we would be in trouble, 
right? So the ancilla has to go from G to F, no matter what the, the photon is, the photon occupation is in the cavity. If that were not the case, and we would measure F, then that would cause decoherence. And that's because even when the operation is completed, you are entangled with the cavity, okay? But because at every single instant of time, the population of the ancilla is uncorrelated with our cavity states, we can measure, and this will not decohere our uh, logical qubits, okay? So the entanglement, there is entanglement, but the population, right, which is in some sense the amplitude squared, is not entangled, okay? There is no information in the population of the ancilla about the logical qubits. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, the T2 here of the ancilla is, is mm -hmm. how important? In, in practice or in? Both. <laughs> well, I think so, in theory I, I see, but in, in practice. So unfortunately, we had a really good transmon with about 50 microseconds uh, plus uh, dephasing times. Um, so we actually, as you know, no, just uh, T2 star, so without echo, yes. I'm, I always confuse the two. No, um, so as you will see to show our points, we, we actually had to add dephasing errors to show that it does the job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a good um, to have. <laughs> yeah, this will be the last slide, so uh, hang on. So, um, uh, and, and and the point here is that uh, it's still a, so T2 errors are, I, I assume you mean dephasing errors, are exactly those errors that project the, the antilla onto its eigenstates. And we know that's okay. okay because, because as I said, the population of the antilla is not entangled with the logical qubits. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. Oh, that's actually, it's really funny because they're really two different pictures here, right? Usually, especially now working here, you know, I think of the phasing errors always as, as random uh, 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 gates being applied, not projections. But you're right that, you know, when you do the uh, either POVM description or, or decomp unraveling decomposition of that uh, channel, you, you know, it's not unique, so you can choose different pictures. Um, and in practice, I mean, so the T2 must matter at some stage, right? Maybe maybe in your mappings or measurements or snaps. So, you know, at, at what level does the uh, T2 of the ancilla now come into play um, with the unitaries and so on? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, now, okay, so I said we are dependent. Well, our path independence is true to infinite order for dephasing. At some point, this will break down. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it would break down, but um, hmm, that's, that's a very good question. And maybe because uh, at some point the snap operation will just not work, right? If your ancilla transitions are so broad that they become broader than the, than the sky, the separation between photon states, then the snap operation just does not work anymore. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, this, this probably will translate into efficiency of the gate and not in the fidelity, right? Uh, uh, what what so, do you mean by efficiency of the gate versus fidelity? Well, well I, I'm not quite sure. So, but, so how often would, would you measure G? How often would the snap not succeed? Okay. Um, this will change. This will. This number will increase when you increase the the amount of dephasing. Um, and maybe I should add also that okay, here's a practical problem with dephasing. So during our snap gate, we don't only apply. Uh, this is maybe just for experts. We don't only apply uh, um, the gates we want to our logical qubit. We we actually also have a small correction for the Kerr effect. Our cavity is not perfectly harmonic. Okay, so um, so if if we uh, don't succeed in applying uh, the snap gates and we stay in G, then it's not exactly the identity that we apply. There is some distortion because of the Kerr effect, which we cannot cancel because the cancellation only works if uh, the snap did its job. 
So this in the end would, uh, would maybe stop you from being uh, protected against the phasing errors. Yeah. Our main problem is with relaxation errors. Mm. And uh, actually, I, I, I just noticed that Wenlong Ma, uh, I think that must be the same Wenlong Ma from the paper, uh, is, is here as well. I, I would just throw in his comments since you can't see uh, his face here. So I'm trying to be the face of the audience uh, uh, as much as possible. The dephasing error makes, makes the Ancilago additional loop paths in the diagram since each loop path produces only an identity operation. So the final operation is only determined by the initial and final Ancilla states. So okay. what Wenlong is referring to are these red circular arrows which correspond to dephasing. So these operations, um, uh, you know, meet the path independence requirements. They're just the identity operation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, but maybe for applying some of the other two-tone uh, or um, off-resonant pulses and things like that, the the line width would matter for for your nonlinear parametrically activated interactions as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, experimental uh, details that I'm leaving out here. Uh, <laughs> I, I just don't want to open the Pandora's box. Uh, <laughs> we can um, leave it for the end of the talk. <laughs> I will just ignore any such questions. So, uh, all right. So let, let me uh, maybe pass to some uh, data, all right? I want to show the experimental results. Uh, but just before that, I want to show you how we do this GF snap operation without ever passing through E. And we do that by using a two photon Raman transition, in which we have one strong tone detuned from the GE transition and a few weak tones detuned from the EF transition. So this, uh, this uh, maybe refers to the question that was asked earlier. You can see that there is one strong tone and many weak tones, each of which, well, three weak tones each of which drive a different photon Fox state simultaneously. Okay, and because there is this detuning from the E state, we never uh, we never populate E unless there is a relaxation event. Okay, so here's the first version of our experiment. We first apply our logical gate, our GF snap gate, and then we measure the ancilla, and finally we perform Wigner tomography to look at our uh, logical qubits dependent or conditioned on the measurement outcome. So here are the experimental results. Uh, you can see that if we are, if we measure that the insula is an F, we get the happy clown face, uh, which means that our gate uh, was successful. Uh, so there was no error in the insula. Now, if there was a relaxation event, we see that the gate also worked. So there is a, a deterministic rotation, which we do not uh, care about so much because it's deterministic. And that's because when we measure uh, the ancilla, uh, there is some state dependent rotations, some ancilla state dependent rotations, I should say. Um, so, so the uh, gate works when we have a relaxation event too. And finally, when we measure G, this corresponds to the phasing event. And we see that, uh, the gate did not work. We're left in the initial uh, cat states, but uh, we should be um, happy about the fact that the coherence is almost perfectly pre preserved, right? So we still see the fringes very nicely. So that means that we have applied a deterministic identity operation to our initial state, which is okay, because we can just start over again. We can reapply the gate, okay? So, uh, we can also do a simulation to see if, uh, if we understand what's going on here. So here's a dynamic situation of a simulation of this GF snap gate. And we see that the, re that the data resemble the simulation very much, except some deterministic rotations. So probably want to skip this slide. It's a bit technical. So now, um, we want to test numerically how well this error corrected gate works. And a good way to do that is by using a tool that's called interleaved randomized benchmarking. So for the experts, we do this by sandwiching our uh, logical snap gates in between random Clifford gates that we generated using optimal control methods. 
And then we measure the probability that after n logical gates, we end up in the correct state. So what you have to remember from this is that we have a way to precisely characterize the infidelity of our logical gate by looking at how fast this uh, randomized benchmarking curve decays. So you can see the results right here. So in, uh, in blue, we have what happens when we use the regular step gate without this measurement of the ancilla and without any feedback. And what we get is a infidelity of 4.6%. And that's mostly because of the ancilla relaxation. Um, but when we use uh, the error corrected gate in red, we get only half that error. So 2.4% error. So even though the error corrected version of the snap gate is more complex, we get a factor of two improvements in the fidelity. Um, and it's important to note here that a sizable fraction of the remaining error is just photon loss. And photon loss we know we can address, right? We just have to measure the parity uh, of the cavity and then uh, correct for that error. So if we ignore photon loss, there is a threefold improvement in, uh, in gate fidelity by using the error corrected version. Okay? And I should emphasize here that the error correction includes ancilla measurements, uh, reset of the ancilla, and a, um, a correction to the, the cavity state. And in the case of measuring uh, dephasing, we reapply the gate. So we have this feedback. Okay, So it's rather complex. So the last piece of data is, in my opinion, the, the most convincing. So I want to show here how well the suppression of error propagation works. So how much can we suppress the propagation of an error in the ancilla to an error in the logical qubit? So the way we do that is by changing the rates at which the errors occur. And I referred to this earlier. So for example, we can induce ancilla relaxation errors by applying a drive between E and F, so some noisy drive. So um, I want to remind you that a relaxation error brings us to E. And you can see here on the left graph that indeed the population in E goes up as we increase this noisy drive. Okay, So we can create fake ancilla relaxation. I, I guess and, you mean uh, relaxation and thermal excitation here. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. So when we apply the drive, it brings F to E, but also E to F. But when the probability of being in E is low to begin with, then we almost only have uh, transitions from F to E. But you're absolutely right. This is only uh, to mimic the effect of relaxation. Yes. Um, but both in, in either case, it's, we should still be path independent. Um, and on the right, what we do to induce the phasing errors, um, we add a noisy drive to the readout resonator. Okay, so we we let the environment measure our qubits and project it, even though we're not looking at the results. Okay, so this induces the phasing, and you can see that the uh, well, the corresponding ancilla state goes up as we increase this drive. So we have these two knobs for controlling um, uh, the artificial noise. So here you can see what the gate infidelity looks like uh, versus the amount of noise that we introduce. So in the case of a non-error corrected, just a regular snap gate, we see that uh, the errors increase at about the same rate as the ancilla errors. Right? The slopes are about the same. So this means that, uh, that the ancilla error is bound to propagate and become a logical error. Okay? Every time an error happens in one, you get an error in the other. So that's really bad uh, for us. However, if we use the error corrected version, so with measurements and this uh, feedback, then we see that the propagation of errors in red here is strongly suppressed. So the gate infidelity goes up much, much slower. So in fact, uh, for relaxation errors, we get an improvement of a factor of six in the slope here. And the improvement is a factor of four in the case of the phasing errors. So the phasing errors are a bit worse because we have to reapply the gate uh, if we measure that. So more things can go wrong. Okay? Um, and once again, these, are, these things are limited by photon loss, which we did not address in this work. 
Okay, so this, uh, these results really establish that our air corrected gates works and that it's really able to suppress air propagation from one uh, part of a system to another uh, using this principle of path independence. So um, this was my last slide. So before I wrap up, and I will, of course, answer many more questions as, as much as you like. Uh, but first of all, I would like again to thank my colleagues at uh, Yale uh, and the Sholkov Lab, especially Philip Reinhold, uh, who was present, and Wen Long Ma as well, for making this uh, work uh, happen. And um, finally, uh, if you would like to combine quantum computing with um, awesome hikes in the desert, then our group, very new group at Weizmann in Israel, is looking um, for uh, really talented and passionate students because we're uh, expanding right now. Our fridges are coming or being installed actually on Monday. So this is a great time to join. And uh, um, yeah, that's about it. So I leave my conclusions up and I'll be happy to answer any remaining questions. Thank you, Serge. This was fantastic. And um, I'm very excited to see the, uh, the picture of the growing lab uh, and with regards to Fabienne. Um, I, we do have some pending questions here from the audience. So uh, one of them here has to do with uh, the readout of the parity, uh, how you do the parity readout, if you can clarify that a little bit more and uh, whether you use the same you know, uh, qubit cavity or there was a second one, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good question. So just to be clear, we do not apply the parity measurement here, which is why we were limited by photon loss pairs. Mm. Um, so the way you measure parity is um, with a relatively, with a scheme that is relatively standard now in the field. Uh, and again, it's uh, done by using the same ancilla. Okay, so uh, this dispersively coupled ancilla. And just very briefly, um, because of this dispersive interaction, the, the ancilla acquires a phase that is linear in the photon number uh, of the cavity. So if you wait for just the right amount of time, which is actually pi over pi, mm -hmm. then the phase becomes plus one for zero, minus one for one, plus one for two, minus one for three, etc. So uh, the phase becomes minus one for all odd states and plus one for all even states. And this we can measure. And in this device, were there two ancilla qubits or one ancilla qubit? There's one ancilla qubit. One ancilla qubit. OK, good. Um, let's see what do. Let's see. Uh, well, this is a more general question, but I'll, I'll share this one with you. I'm sure some people are curious. Uh, do you have to use error correction for all types of quantum computers? <laughs> um, that's a, a very good question. And I think the answer is. Uh, very likely, yes, unless a completely new platform comes up. Um, and that's because qubits are just, by their very nature, extremely fragile. Right. Okay. So transistors are, classical transistors, the, the reason that they are so, you know, so um, robust to errors is because they're, you know, they're relatively big systems, right? They're macroscopic systems. They contain millions of, of atoms. And they include internal dissipation. These are all things we cannot afford. So our mm -hmm. our qubits are um, pristine quantum states that are extremely sensitive to any interaction with the environment. So unless some some completely new platform comes up, error correction will be needed. Mm -hmm. Not just error correction, many levels of error correction. Right. Yeah. I think they, the the question here comes also from a mindset of topological quantum computing. We don't need to necessarily go there, but uh, I see yeah, my answer was, was relevant for that too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, Topological qubits are super interesting. Uh, so they have some inherent, protect, inherent protection against theirs. But I should remind uh, the audience that also superconducting qubits have some inherent protection, right? Because they are protected by um, by the superconducting gap and in our dilution refrigerators, mm. uh, uh, you know, we are not supposed to have any dissipation of any kind, but in practice, uh, you always have some physical effects that, um, that ruin the story and introduce some errors. So while I'm really not an expert in topological qubits, I would assume that there, there are some parasitic effects there 
at some scale that you would have to, that you would have to address. Yeah, one one effect I've so kept stayed up at night about is of course quasi particle poisoning. Something we worry about that that. Uh, uh, the gap doesn't always help you with, right? That goes over the gap in superconducting circuits, but is also an issue for, for the typical topological Majorana types of uh, nanowire qubits and so on. So anyway. Absolutely. But still, yeah. it's extremely interesting to find out how well topological will do in reality. I guess the idea there is that you are supposed to start at a much higher initial baseline level, uh, you know, once that's all demonstrated, um, but it, it you know, there's no free lunch. It seems like you have to do some sort of error correction, I think, to summarize what you're saying. I, I agree. And um, some qubits will be better and some qubits will be worse. But in the end, if we want a universal quantum computer that can factorize a 2000 bit number, the error rates are just astoundingly low. And the only realistic way of getting there is by applying some, some amount of error correction. Yeah, um, the, this is an interesting discussion I also had uh, with uh, Ephraim Steinberg, who I think will also talk here recently, and actually we've invited for the seminar, you know, we have to worry about also the entanglement between the light uh, that you use to drive your pi pulses and so forth, and uh, the qubit left behind, right? So so light that you use to drive your pulses isn't classical, it's also quantum, and there's some residual entanglement that will limit you also at some fidelity as well. Uh, maybe moving forward to the next question to your experiment, to your uh, lab and experiment, uh, this is also a more general question. Are there any plans to scale this procedure up to a larger number of logical qubits? Um, so that's a very good question. So um, uh, scaling up to very large uh, number of qubits is not something that is typically done in academia. Uh, but I do hope there are some very interesting um, startup companies and and non-startup companies that are uh, interested in using these bosonic codes for doing quantum computation. Um, there's uh, at least two, uh, two companies in the US and one in Europe that are interested in that. And so I hope that these schemes uh, would be interesting to them. So uh, yeah, bosonic quantum computation is very much um, a thing that is uh, that is scaling up these these days. Excellent. Um, well, I should say that, that these uh, the concepts I was discussing um, might also be applied to non-bosonic qubits, right? I'm not exactly sure how, but this uh, idea of path independence is uh, is on purpose stated in a very general way, so it might be be of interest to you as well to spin people. Uh, I I think it's a great idea. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I love it. And you've done a beautiful demonstration. Um, so I think that brings us to the uh, end of our questions. If I miss any questions, I apologize. Please post them now before we close up. Uh, but I'd like to open it up at the end of, of the seminar to uh, any final thoughts and words you would like to share with the audience. Um, or, you know, uh, we often have a lot of folks from the summer school lectures who come and are interested also in more general, you know, advice entering the quantum field and career and so forth. So I'll open it up to you to any uh, state. Thank you. I, I didn't plan on uh, thinking of final words for the coming two decades, but um, <laughs> I, will, uh, I will just thank you for, for inviting me. I really appreciate that. And um, I'd be happy to answer anyone's questions offline as well. Absolutely. Uh, Serge, thank you very much. It was uh, my absolute delight and pleasure to see you again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in today. We will be back next week, uh, same time, Friday at Eastern. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, you can go back and watch this talk. Uh, it will stay posted here live on YouTube. Serge, thank you uh, very much for tuning in. Uh, and uh, see you next week, everyone.